Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. I wanted to go a little retro today before I go forward. My overall is I would like to cover how we use our program, if you will. This is not as an advertisement for a program. This is saying, I wish somebody was doing this program when I was really sick. It would have uh, shaved off four or five years of my getting better and knowing exactly what was going on and exactly how to treat it. I do believe that. I'm going to discuss four different cases, if you will, four different people, four different conditions, and how... We got to look more deeply, certainly more deeply than they had ever understood themselves to be, and therefore able to help them. I was about to use the word treat, but I don't really like to say treat. We basically address things that we see that are usually pretty poorly deficient or way out of line. And that usually goes along with understanding what they call pathophysiology, understanding the condition that they have, saying, you know, this fits with that. This, If you fix this, their condition is going to be less extreme. Maybe you've taken off, you've amped it down, you've decreased the inflammation by X. Then you do the next thing and decrease the inflammation and or the symptomology even further. And it takes time for the body to recalibrate as you do these things and go forward. So I'm going to break it down by these four panels and then go forward and tell you how it just makes sense. And the reason I'm telling you this is not like you're going to give me a call or contact me or PM me and say, hey, yeah, I want to do your program. No, I would, if I were you, what I would do, I would hear this information and I would then seek out a physician in your area because our program works only in the United States. And even then, there's a few states whose uh, laws are such that make it very awkward for me to order labs in those states. Those states are basically New York and New Jersey because they are afraid of competition. Nothing to do with health or medicine. It's about competition. How American, eh? But I mean, if you're listening from Qatar or Uzbekistan or Norway or Australia, then I can't imagine that what I'm doing is that different? There's got to be an awareness in your community and your medical community as well that has these components. So I'm going to break out the components so you can look at it in your hand and say, hmm, that makes sense. And if I were somebody who had a pretty dire situation, I would definitely make that effort to find those people and understand these particular lenses, if you will. So different panels that we're going to go through, just four. And it's not going to be, I'm going to, I was about to say, dumb it down. I'm going to reduce it so it, you don't see it's so sophisticated. The information is very illuminating, is very helpful to you, and it's not beyond you understanding. This is clearly putting the information on your counter in front of you, slicing and dicing it in very easy piles to say, this is what this is. You know, we are all specialists, no matter what we do. We are all specialists in our lives which then means we've invested so much time to understand a particular environment, occupational environment and occupation, that when we go outside of that, we are as ignorant as a third grader. So if I'm a physician, which I am, and I've focused on natural health and labs and all this other stuff and you know all medical things, well, I know nothing about plumbing. I know very little about electricity. And I go to a specialist. 
to help me either A, understand if I think I'm going to be doing this myself as a weekend warrior kind of thing, or get them to work with me in getting a project done in the house. So it is to everything. So we are very ignorant outside of our specialty, unless we've taken it upon ourselves when we don't have to focus on our specialty to educate ourselves in kind of a um, liberal arts way that is in a more broad way. So we get to relate to more people. Okay. So what I wanted to say is when I got started, the reason I even came in this direction, I don't think I really would have been aware of keto, the ketogenic diet, ketones, nutritional ketosis, all these different things. If I wasn't very, very sick and I was very, very sick from 2000, uh, pretty much 2012 for the second half, mother died, brother died, wife had a, a brain tumor, a meningioma was in the process of losing and then did lose vision in her right eye. We had to, we had just finished filing for bankruptcy, which was stretched out over the previous four years. We were doing so well as a practice that we bought a big medical building, big being it could serve more than, you could fit a few practices in there. And we poured all our money into it thinking it was untouchable. You know, it was kind of the thing that will never get ruined and we can upgrade it and improve it. And then when it comes time to retire, we can just sell it and that would be our retirement. Well, we were severely wrong. So we put all our eggs in one basket, something you're never supposed to do, but we thought we had checked it out. We had rented, we had practiced, we had the demand for our practice. So 2008 came along and the economy didn't really hit the basement, didn't really go dramatically south for a good six months for a year. And then 2009 and 10 and 11, it just it took all the air out of the room, as they say. So we held on uh, longer than we should. It happened to be all these things, bad things happened in the course of one year. So all that stress came to me and there was no way out of it. There was no, there was no door to open in my life as I viewed it then, other than prayer and meditation and so on, to take the top off of all the stress I was feeling. So it, just was overwhelming and my gut exploded. I had no history of ulcerated colitis. I had no history of Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune condition. And yet I had both of these blew up in the course of, oh, I would say a month to two. And it was the worst it had ever been imaged in the hospital when I was in Connecticut, in New London, Connecticut. And, you know, they put me on steroids right away and there began the worsening of all these things. So let me interject for a second. If there was a guy down the street, a woman down the street, a physician who had these four panels of the program we have now, that is a good comprehensive lab panel, I'm calling metabolic, and had uh, would get a spectra cell on me. That's something I could have and did do for myself. But the I didn't know about the 24-hour urine panel of this company. I knew about that from other ways, you know. And then I did know something about genome, but I was just too tired and beat up to go look back at all of the possible mutations that could contribute to what I was experiencing. Had I done that, had I had an external person saying, these are the tests, I'll interpret it for you, I'll put it back together, and I'll say, these are things we can address to make you better quickly, that would have been great. I was just done I became severely anemic. And when you're severely anemic, and I'm talking about uh, numbers of 13, 14, and 15, when they're supposed to be 45. So I had less than three cups, two and a half cups of blood in my entire body when you're supposed to have nine and 10 cups. So I was just beyond, I needed help. So obviously I sought a gastroenterologist to get my colonoscopy. And he said, yep, it's it's the worst we've ever seen. Here are the steroids. You'll be on this for a couple of months. If that doesn't work, then we'll have to think about bowel resection, meaning clipping off the inflamed parts of your small and large intestine. That was pretty dire. So this came out of left field and pretty extreme. Either this works or we do that. Classic allopathic medicine. It's just my feelings are, and I think you deserve hearing my prejudices and my opinions, which is extremely simplistic, highly reductionist. You have two choices, insert profanity here and say, absolutely it's not. The person is not the condition. So had I had a metabolic 
Labs, which I'm going to go over today on four conditions later, had I had the intracellular micronutrient data, had I had the 24-hour uh, hormone panel, had I had um, a complete genomic map, I don't mean the whole genome, but of the 80 or 90 known problematic mutations put together, it would have been very helpful. And having somebody else formulate a plan for me, absolutely. Probably would have been a month or two and then off I would get back to normal as opposed to having to climb out of this terrible spot. Anyway, so in, that was my beginning of all this. So that's why I'm reporting this is by saying, I wish there's somebody in your community that offers these same things. I'm not saying that I'm unique. I'm saying that good training puts these things together and this is where you look at. This is, I believe, should be and will be the future of medicine. This is where people look at. Whereas right now, if you were to go into your family practice physician and ask them to do a genomic workup, they 99.99% would not have any idea of how to do that. If you ask them about a 24-hour urine sequentially done, it's actually a dried urine, it's called a Dutch test, they would not know how to interpret those. If you had asked them for a comprehensive metabolic blood work panel, they might have a clue on half of that, but half of that would they would have no clue about. And what was the other part? The intracellular micronutrient levels. They would think it was a gimmick. I don't think it's a gimmick. I think it's real medicine. This is how you differentiate the individual from the condition they have. So not everybody that has fatty liver has the same situation. Yeah, they all have liver enzymes that are out of range, but they've come to it slightly differently. And yeah, they're probably all obese and they might be diabetic as well or certainly pre-diabetic. So these are generalizations you can staple together, but they will probably have different genomic problems and pathways that led them to it, different micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, they may well have different hormonal concerns as well, that they've driven themselves to these problems through their diet and their environment. Okay, so what did I do? Well, when I was trying to climb out of the hole, the best I knew, I said, you know, obviously I don't know enough to help myself. And as the steroids, at least, actually they exacerbated an anemia, but they gave me a little bit of a respite. Oh, I got four blood transfusions too. That's something. And with those four blood transfusions, I then took it upon myself to go to two international gastroenterology conferences saying, I don't know enough about this and I need to learn to talk to experts or meet the experts in this field. So I found two conferences separated by four months. One happened to be, I was kind of lucky, there's one international conference that goes between Spain and, and Miami. It happened to be a Miami year. So that means I didn't have to leave the country. And the other was this world presentation at the University of Chicago, downtown, of course. And they attracted all uh, the GI gastroenterologists. And uh, so I befriended them on by email, got to know them, asked them questions, met them at the conferences, went further with what they were doing. And so that's where I got into fecal microbiota transplant. So that was how I was getting an awareness of helping myself. So that's sort of the obvious answer. You know, my bowel is destroyed. It's killing me. What am I missing? I clearly was in the direction of, hey, I'll take the probiotics to fill in the gaps. You know, that, that must be the way to do it. And I had been using probiotics on nearly everybody for the previous couple of decades. However, I learned about both of these things and I got to meet some amazing people doing some amazing work worldwide. One was Dr. Thomas Brody, who was from Australia, and he is probably the number one FMT, fecal microbiota transplant person in the world, has a whole clinic built around this in into probiotics. I think that was a leg up for me, both to talk to him and then to go through all this, the wife being the donor. Okay, so that phase passed and I still, I, I was improved, but I wasn't, there were still big gaps in my health. And that's where I came into thinking, you know, I think I have a fungal infection in my gut, and this is the thing that's perpetuating it. So I actually asked the doctor, the GI that I was working, the gastro guy I was working with at the time who did the colonoscopy on me. Uh, he was not very well educated, but had a thriving business. Shows you don't really need to be educated to have a thriving business. Just need the business model down. And I said, this is my thinking. Um, what's the possibility of you prescribing to me, Nystatin, 
which was an antifungal. Uh, it was an off-label use for gut. And um, he did. And in the course of four weeks, things, you know, blood started getting better. And then in four weeks, he nixed the prescription saying it was off-label use and he felt uncomfortable and he wouldn't do that anymore for me. So I had to find another doctor. Welcome to the United States. The next doctor is where I got the four blood transfusions from. The point I'm leading to is you have to be your own driver in your own health. And yeah, you don't know the questions right away to ask, but your questions will get better as your experience gets better. And it really depends on you. So maybe I'm speaking specifically from an American perspective, so be it. I can't make that comparison, but the onus is on you. If your health goes downhill and it's retrievable, meaning you can bring it back, then it's on you to figure that out. Ideally, it'd be nice to find a doctor who can help you do that, but uh, there's not that many around. There's not that many that have the time to invest in a person that much. That's why it's on you. Okay, so from there, that was the antifungal. You stopped that, so then I remembered from med school, caprylic acid. What do you know about caprylic acid? That's called C8, C8 MCT oil. Well, it was only in supplements at the time. You know, I wasn't quite sure, what about the dose? Do I take a few? Do I take a lot? The whole idea of caprylic acid scared me, thinking I don't want to burn out my gut. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's a, <laughs> it's a saturated fat. Would have been a better way to describe it. But some improvement there, and then we learned where to buy it in bulk and um, sustainably harvested, and that got us into our product. So that was a big deal. So now we're still at the MCT oil stage, which does have a history and from in the history and evolution of the ketogenic diet, which I talked about way back at the beginning of these podcasts. Okay, so from there, I started to go more deeply. This is 2013, learning about what ketones are and ketosis and how that's different than diabetic ketoacidosis. And this was a couple of years before any of the medical conferences on exogenous ketones or keto groups, because there wasn't any place to go. You had some books out called The Art and Science of Low-Carb Living, Low-Carb Performance by Jeff Fulick and Steve Finney, and they were very helpful. So there's that. But so now let's go forward now, and I want to show you that I do believe carbs are a environment in which a lot of diseases can get started. Absolutely. And I do believe most diseases start in the gut. That's almost cliche if you're in natural medicine or all, all illness starts in the gut. It goes back to supposedly Hippocrates or even before that. Looking at how you can bring these factors back together, you don't have a disease. What you have are a number of contributing factors that lead to a certain level of inflammation. And that inflammation is the thing that starts to destroy, starts to burn out, probably gut-related, but then it might go to neurology, your your nerves, it might go to someplace else. And also there's a your life experience now, meaning what you've been exposed to is now a variable without getting too far into the environmental aspect of it. Okay, so that's how this works. You're not the disease, you have a diagnosis, but you have a lot of contributing factors that are different than the next person with that same diagnosis. What I want to talk about are four conditions, in essence, four people, and I'm going to make them kind of, uh, I'm obviously not going to talk about the specific people, but I'm going to make it into kind of an avatar so I can speak about it anonymously. Okay, so what we're going to talk about are is a woman in her late 30s who's concerned about infertility, what happened to her. We're going to talk about a woman who had hormonal imbalances, and we're not talking about due to surgical intervention. We're talking about the, all anatomy is present, uh, all endocrine anatomy is present. We're going to talk about a man in his mid-50s who is uh, has fatty liver and is 100 pounds overweight. And we're going to talk about, generally, call it a obesity, diabetes, and we're not going to talk about just the obvious. Oh, they all had weight to lose. We helped them lose weight and they all got better. The weight is really a symptom of something else going on. The weight is not a condition, even though there are diagnosis codes of simply being overweight. That's not very helpful. A lot of diagnosis codes are not very helpful uh, in looking very deeply. When we look at you know some of this, I'm going to describe how we look at these panels. So these panels are basic blood work called CBC. 
We look at your white blood cells and your red blood cells. That's what a CBC is with diff, as they say. We look at your thyroid, T3, T4, free, TSH, uh, thyroid antibodies, and that would be autoimmune aspects, if there is such an autoimmune aspect. Uh, we look at inflammatory markers. Uh, we look at insulin, glucose, glucagon, which nobody does. Few people even do insulin. Uh, hemoglobin 1AC, that's what diabetics do. Or It's also good regardless if you're not diabetic to do it. We look at what they call your lipid panel, but I'm not so much interested in cholesterol or LDL. I'm interested in triglycerides and HDL. And that ratio is very telling, very telling. That's the meat of the value of the lipid panel. We look into insulin resistance. Those are formulas, basically. We look into insulin-like growth factor, IGF. And now that you've listened to the previous two podcasts on Laron syndrome and before that dairy, you know how important IGF is, so insulin-like growth factor. Did you catch the insulin-like? Very similar structurally. And as I said in the dairy one, that the cow's IGF, which you then consume when you consume dairy, is exactly identical to human IGF. So it kind of gets amplified as we have theirs, it bangs ours up. And that's how on that number alone, we get to see who's a dairy consumer and who's not. Um, also, those are high levels are obviously cancer inducing. That's kind of a gray area because we go to annually a, the, actually the head of um, surgical neurology for my wife's follow-up now that it's been an uneventful, what, seven years since that, but we still go up and ask our questions and so on and so forth. So from his perspective, uh, he looks for IGF to be really high. You know, that's causative, you know, like there's a tumor that is causing that. Um, in terms of, you know, the range of IGF is 50 to 350. Well, that's quite a range, 50 to 350. And yet, we found in the numbers we're taking, those that are up in the high twos and threes are those that are far more dairy consumers and usually much more obese and probably, frankly, frank diabetic. I mean, they are diagnosed and have all the characteristics of a diabetic. So I think it does correlate with a degree of problem. I don't say pathology, but problem. So I, it's it's something. And hence, Lerone's syndrome and that's the other side of that coin, right? Then we look at liver enzymes, of course, otherwise known as LFTs, liver function tests, kidney. So when we get into micronutrients or vitamins, we look at folate, B12, methylmalonic acid, homocysteine. That's a really interesting one. We look at your omega-3s, your omega-6s. That's really important to look at. Certainly carnitine, vitamin D. And so carnitine is interesting in that, and this just, this is not like a, a brilliant insight, but really over 20 years, like you can count with almost absolute certainty that you have a person that comes to you, call them a patient or client who's a vegan, meaning the only vegetables, that they're going to be really low in carnitine and they're going to have a very tough time with both the complaint about their energy level, they're going to complain about, you know, their they're not going to have much in the way of muscle mass. They may even be overweight. They may not be overweight. It's a little bit not to do with this particular test. But when you give them carnitine, and the reason they're low on carnitine is because they're not meat eaters, so they have no source of carnitine. So it's one of the things that vegans have to take is carnitine. They also usually have to take folate and B12, even though the story is, oh, wait a minute, a vegetarian, you know, you know, folate, the, the word came from folio being leaf, and it came from spinach leaf. That's where the name was derived. However, in terms of the best sources of folate that the body can use, that the body can use are animal meats. So when you see a vegetarian, a vegan, and you can count on, there'll be low B12, there'll be probably very high methylmalonic acid, there'll probably be very borderline low or low on, on folate or folic acid, and ideally doing red blood cells. So that's caused by their diet. They did this themselves for whatever reason. And they got worse and worse until they finally snapped and then changed their diet or died. And certainly vitamin D is all over the place. And you know, the, the stupid thing about vitamin D, and I'm trying to do a series of YouTubes on this, is that you have some absolutely moronic MDs that go, you know, vitamin D really just doesn't matter. And it's such a political play. It's such a political play because it is so beneficial, certainly in now in the times of COVID, but you actually have UK 
health backtracking saying we no longer believe vitamin D is is helpful. And then you have Scotland, which right now still is part of the UK, is actually giving out free vitamin D to everybody. So is Finland. And Finland's giving out free vitamin D to everybody to make sure they're getting enough vitamin D to tamp down the COVID incidence or the severity of. So you have countries that are intelligent on separate sides. I think it's highly political in the UK to say that it's not effective. But here's how they explain that. So right now I'm looking at a list of, I don't know, about 40 vitamin Ds right across a a spreadsheet of of people who've come through our program, which makes it nice to look at a spreadsheet. And, you know, we have a low of seven, a low of 10, we have a high of 75, and we have numbers in the middle. So if I was to go and just give vitamin D across the board to everybody, you know, let's say 5,000 IUs per day. Well, the person who's, and we don't know if they have a genetic problem, right? We don't know about their genome yet. We're going to get to that last panel later. So let's put that out. So if I give, and we're, we're all going to pretend for this at this particular moment of analysis, that they're all normal, okay? They're all normal on their ability to use vitamin D. Supposition. So the person I give the 5,000 I use to, that's a seven, you know, in a week or two, they're going to come back saying, you know, kiss my feet. They want to make a statue of me saying, I've saved their life and because their depression's going to go away. Their energy's going to come up. Their sleep is going to get better. And it's only because there's such a severe deficiency in this person that it made a tremendous difference. The person that was at 44 or 75, they're going to go, well, I really didn't notice anything. You know, it's like, yeah, it's okay. I get you got to do it. You got to do it. And the person who was at 10 is also probably going to have a remarkable story. So the point is, and it's such an easy one to point to, and that's why I pull it out, and that's why I test for it, is that it depends on your status of vitamin D now. Yes, you can get it in the sun. It depends where you live in the world, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a way to at least supplement. And it's if you're going to supplement, it's D3 with K2, and then take some magnesium as well. Another story, another time. Just take my word for it right now. But anyway, we're saying if you're really deficient, you're going to think it's incredible. So when people go through their opinions of of the effectiveness of our program really depends a lot of, A, their condition, right? What are all these individual factors that we analyze? So these people that had more normal or normal vitamin D, it doesn't mean they didn't have other problems. Let me just scoot down. In fact, the one person who had fairly normal vitamin D, had thyroid problems, and this person was on a lot of supplements and had been on a lot of supplements. They had on 28 daily supplements on a regular basis. And so on the vitamin D way of looking at things, he was doing hunky-dory. However, other things, he was out of line. Homocysteine wasn't great. Uh, His insulin was good, and his glucose was okay. But we'll get... So his story so far is not really revealing in any way. I'm just sort of scooting through. Still had fairly high, oh, he had very low glucagon, very low glucagon, borderline hypothyroid. But on the vitamin D story, he was doing fine. So you have to look for other things. That's what I'm saying is that that particular set of two people, one being a man and the other being a woman, um, with, and they both actually had very low glucagon, one thing they had in common. And they both had thyroid issues. So you have to look at the thing that's most efficient in the very least. So, so far, as I started, this is not great, great insight in medicine. You're looking for the things that are deficient that you can bring something to. So you can, A, tell a person vitamin D if they're wherever they live, go get some vitamin D by going outside 15 minutes a day around noon when the sun's out, or take a supplement, you know, make a life, life change. So I'll leave it at that. So when we started with the person that was 50s, 100 pounds to lose, fatty liver, what did we do? We looked for, and obviously, very elevated inflammation. That person had very elevated homocysteine. And homocysteine, uh, and so they call it homocysteinemia, meaning they see it in your blood. And if it even gets worse, it's homocysteinuria. They'll see it in the urine. That's really extreme not seeing so much. And that's, these are all caused by the urea, seeing it in your urine is definitely caused by genetics only. But with emia, it can be addressed. And it's usually B12, folate, and people can argue about whether it has to be 
methylated B12 or not, methylated folic acid or not, and then N-acetylcysteine. It's because we looked at these are have to do with genomic pathways. But when we see it high and people who have a lot of dairy, elevated homocysteine, people who are deficient in, however they got there, B12, folic acid, they will have elevated homocysteine. So you can treat it and you can treat it with other supplements as well. And usually the people that are very depressed, even schizophrenia, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, heart disease, certainly heart disease, go along with elevated homocysteine. And yet it's treatable. It's very treatable. You can bring it down to normal, like you're letting air out of a balloon. It happened over a couple months, certainly in the course of 90 days. So that's treatable, and there's no reason one should have that unless they have that genetic issue. But even if they had the urea, that can be treated as well. It's just in a more extreme presentation of that. So that's what this man who had the fatty liver, we started there. We also looked at, he was insulin resistant. His insulin was up. His fasting insulin was very high. His glucose was borderline high by itself. So borderline high is he was 113. He could be lower, ideally under 100 would be nice, but 113 would not expel you from your doctor's office. It would make him or her take notice of it and say, when you come back in six weeks or three months, uh, let's do this again, see where it is. That's as, as much of a warning as you would get. But had that doctor taken fasting insulin at the same time and seen it was 27, he or she would have taken your situation, if you're that man, more seriously. So there's are things that we can address just in this panel alone. What else caught my eye on that person? Besides elevated liver enzymes, which was kind of the definition, that's about it. And potential hyperthyroid, one of his thyroid T4s are high. And so therefore, what you find is once you have the inflammation, and usually when somebody gets to be 100 pounds overweight and they get to have these liver enzymes, their liver is starting to poop out because they can't store any more glucose in the form of glucagon. Next, it's going to start to burn out is going to be the pancreas, and you're going to find that they're not going to be able to produce enough insulin. You know, Eventually, that function starts to go, and then they really get into trouble. So it's a good place to turn things around, and this is all being fed by probably... Well, I know specifically in this case, a normal diet of a lot of highly processed carbs in addition to other things. Yeah, they had their salad. They were proud of their salad and they didn't think that they were overdoing it. And they didn't overdo necessarily the alcohol, but they liked their beer every so often. On and on it goes. So it just slid into something worse and worse and worse. So if he's not going to wake up in his mid-50s, he's just not going to wake up to better health. And so the woman for hormone imbalance, we obviously measured you know, I got her data, but we're now just talking about the metabolic panel. What we found is inflammation was there. We found uh, her lipid panel, her, forgot to mention on the last person, the triglycerides are very high and the HDL is very low. So things that we could address. Hers is borderline hypothyroid, borderline Hashimoto's hyperthyroid. So these are things that can be addressed inch by inch. And so when I say thyroid and we're addressing it, I'm not saying, well, we send them to an endocrinologist and they pop you full of one of four different types of thyroid, and you're good. No, that's not looking. See, that's that's a very mechanistic way of looking at things. We look for the contributing factors that caused for you to be underproducing your thyroid hormone. And usually that starts in the gut. Usually it has to do with blood sugar. It always has to do with blood sugar problems. So whether it's low glucagon, elevated insulin, elevated glucose, they're all related. You know, the fire starts. So when you start, it's a twig burning and then it's a twig, small sticks. And after that, it's small logs and it's bigger logs. It's still a fire. It started small. You got to reduce the fire back to the twigs, back to the kindling that it started with. And that's pretty much it. So when we start naming somebody's disease by, by analogy, by saying, oh, that person's at the log level of, of inflammation. And we give that a name because that particular log is burning. It could be multiple sclerosis. That log would be named neurons, certain neurons, and then we'd look for certain patterns. It's still an extension of a metabolic problem, it's still an extension of a prolonged, protracted, chronic, elevated levels of glucose that can be brought down. And it's been destructive. It's been breaking down their mitochondria that it does not work anymore. And it's, they're well on their way. Inflammation is really multi-named stage 
progression to cancer. And even those cancers have its own little names. Go back to the interviews I did with Tom Siegfried and so on. So that's where this is. We still come back to the biggest thing we can treat, which is let's get our mitochondria back to being healthy. And it isn't going to happen overnight. And it isn't going to happen because you got a hack. Somebody told you about a mitochondrial hack to get back into good mitochondria. You know. So if you're going to fast, if you did nothing else and fast enough so you didn't die, that would be a good start because at least you've stopped the eating of processed carbs. And in the fasting, so we're talking about in the very, I'm not saying this works for everybody and it's also a tough way to go, but that tends to slide you into ketosis, which is what we're doing by dropping the carbs anyway, as we get into that later. All right. So who else is saying we're talking about? We're going to talk about the pseudo-obesity, hormones, fatty liver, and infertility. So the woman in her late 30s who has a difficult time getting pregnant, in fact, has never been pregnant, is wanting to have a family for the last now nearly a decade and a half, if not two decades. And she and her husband have yet to start a family and they're wondering why. Well, this is at least a start. So what would this metabolic panel show me relative to her and did show me? That she has some characteristics of what they call PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which still is the same definition saying chronically high glucose resulted in these particular changes. But it can go all the way down to hirsutism, which is basically growing a mustache for women, to male pattern baldness, to elevated lipid panel, and so on and so forth. So when you see these factors, you begin the same thing. So now we go, okay, well, there's a metabolic issue here, and we kind of see, we identified it on this particular layer. So we now have infertility, something we can address. We had certainly the fatty liver, something we can address. We had the hormone imbalance, and we had the obesity. So those are all taken care of. Next, we're going to go into the next panel, the micronutrients. And after that, we're going to go into the hormone panel, sequential hormone panel, what that tells us. And last, we're going to end up on the genome. And they're all vital. The way I see this in my mind, these are four panels that are squished together in a way, an imaginary way. And that makes the lens through which I see that individual that says, this is how that person is different than all the others that have infertility or obesity or fatty liver or hormone imbalance or name your issue. And that's how we can bring them back into a healthy place to be. So we haven't talked about diet, but under this, while we're doing all these tests, these tests are done before the program starts. And when the program starts, we then focus on dietary intervention split by two parts. First six weeks, second six weeks. First six weeks is dropping the freaking carbs down to a classic ketogenic diet. And if they want to go carb-free, they can go carb-free, but more than likely, some people are going to have problems doing that. And if I found in the group, whatever group I'm working with, somebody has an unusually low glucagon, they probably will have a thyroid, hypothyroid issue as well. And they will find it very difficult to suddenly drop the carbs. So you got to be very, I won't say gentle, but you have to stair step and many smaller steps all the way along. Because if you just ask them and they had the discipline say, I'm just going to stop carbs because you said it was a good thing to do and all my health is going to come back in time. And they would probably get very depressed. They probably even get dizzy, get episodes of uh, vertigo. They would get very maudlin. They would probably kind of goes along with the depression, just be very emotionally fragile. So you can't just muscle people into the same little box. We're going to like, you know, shoehorn you in and you're going to do what I say. That's not what you do. And these were the labs, and I've learned this as well. These were the labs tell me this person, at least from these labs, we've ruled out they don't have an obstacle that's going to blow up in their face that way. And those who do have that, I then put them kind of in a separate category and bring them on a little more slowly. Then the second half, second six weeks, the last six weeks, what we do is we drop the fats. So I don't emphasize the fats up front if they want to have more fats, you know, the C8 and so on and so forth. But on the other part, we don't drop the fats like you don't have fats. I'm saying we're not going to add any fats. You're going to be primarily, call it a carnivore. I'm using that word loosely. And so we have gone from dropping the carbs to dropping the fats. If they have, if they're on the heavy side. If they don't have fat to lose, then we'll make sure they'll say, you know, eat the fat that comes with your meat, eat the fat that's part of your fish or the chicken and so on and so forth. For others, we will start with a portion of the week saying we're going to be fatless. We're going to be skinless on the chicken. We're going to be skinless on the fish. We're going to be trim the fat 
for a few days during the week and we open up the weeks to be longer. You know, so it's by the end of the program, they've gone a couple of weeks with very low fat and they'll find that it's been a dramatic change, providing we have not discovered some major obstacle uh, on the various panels. So we told you what the obstacle will be on the metabolic panel. When we go on to the next panel, we will also see if there's some obstacles that we can address. They'll make it easier for everybody. And that's usually what happens. Until next time, uh, I know you're getting a lot of information, trying to keep it simple. But what I'm trying to put in front of you are the variables that I would ask your physician to take, to order, to get for you. And now what I think your relationship should be with you and your family physician is that that is your coach. They are coaching you. They are teaching you in whatever time intervals you can afford to be in front of them to go through that. And you can, even if it's just pointing to what what should I read in the meantime between our appointments, you need to learn for yourself. Don't offload that like you're looking for some sort of virtual assistant and you don't have to pay attention to it. You have to pay attention to your body. You have to be your specialist for the most part to your body. Okay, till next time. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. Stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.